This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. Good morning, I'm John Trout. It's Thursday, March 7th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Haley bows out. The time has now come to suspend my campaign. I'm Linda Kenyon in Washington. New York officials calling on the National Guard to patrol the subways. Making sure that weapons are not being brought in. I'm John Stolnes. A ruling against a longtime federal government agency. I'm Clayton Neville. Houthi missile strike kills three on a cargo ship bound for Saudi Arabia. We'll have the update. On Wall Street, stocks with a modest rebound yesterday after the sell-off the day before. Today, we get earnings from Costco. I'm Jessica Edinger. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey has signed legislation that chills IVF providers. I'm Lisa Dwyer. The House has passed a package of spending bills that would avert a partial government shutdown. We're not going to get everything that we want. Ed Donahue, Washington. All ahead on America in the Morning. Following this week's Super Tuesday voting, a looming question. Following Nikki Haley's decision to suspend her campaign, where will those supporters go now? Here's our Linda Kenyon from Washington. And then there were two, as Donald Trump won 14 out of the 15 GOP contests, and President Biden won all of the Democratic primaries, setting the stage for a showdown that will look very much like the last one. Republican Nikki Haley won the primary in Vermont, denying Trump a full sweep on Super Tuesday. And on Wednesday, she said this. The time has now come to suspend my campaign. Haley bowed out with grace. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. But she also said Donald Trump will have to reach out to her supporters and those who have not yet decided. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. Supporters like these folks. I just can't bring myself to vote for Trump. Life is not going to get better for the average American, I don't think under another four years of Donald Trump. What does Trump think about winning over Haley supporters? They're going to all vote for me again. They're going to all vote for me again, everybody. And I'm not sure we need too many. Trump did get the endorsement of the Senate's Republican leader, Mitch McConnell. I said in February of 2021, shortly after the attack on the Capitol, that I would support President Trump if he were the nominee of our party, and he obviously is going to be the nominee of our party. McConnell was the last member of the GOP leadership to endorse Donald Trump. The two had often criticized each other. On the Democratic side... Clearly and convincingly, uh, Democratic primary voters have opined that I'm not that guy. That guy is Dean Phillips, who launched a long-shot bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. And Phillips said President Biden is the only candidate who should win the White House. And while indeed I think the president is at a stage in life where his capacities are diminished, he is still a man of competency and decency and integrity. And the alternative, Donald Trump, is a very dangerous, dangerous man. Lindy Kenyon, Washington. President Biden tonight will no doubt showcase what he believes his accomplishments are on infrastructure and manufacturing in the State of the Union address. America's oldest president will speak to Congress and voters questioning whether he's up for the job. State officials in New York are ramping up security in the subway system after a string of recent high-profile crimes has left residents feeling skittish about using the rails. More on the story from our John Stolness. With New Yorkers feeling more nervous than ever about riding the city's subways, Governor Kathy Hochul announcing she's redeploying nearly 1,000 members of the New York State Police, Transit Police, and National Guard to conduct bag checks in the city's busiest transit stations. So we'll be having 750 members of the New York National Guard, as well as another 250 personnel from state and MTA police. You'll start seeing them at the tables, making sure that weapons are not being brought in, working in in concert with our New York State Police, as well as our NYPD. Last Sunday, a 64-year-old man was kicked onto the tracks at Penn Station while he was checking his phone, having to be pulled out of harm's way by fellow commuters. Last Friday, a 27-year-old man was slashed after a man wielding a knife made homophobic comments at him. Last month, a subway conductor was slashed in the neck by someone with a knife, and another conductor was hit in the head with a glass bottle yesterday. These brazen heinous attacks on our subway system 
will not be tolerated. As part of her five-point plan, the governor says there should be more surveillance cameras in subway stations, and she wants legislation enacted that would bar anyone who has committed a crime on the subway system from ever using it again. Random bag checks are already underway. Because no one heading to their job or to visit family or to go to a doctor appointment should worry that the person sitting next to them possesses a deadly weapon. They shouldn't worry about whether someone's going to brandish a knife or gun. Crime in New York subway systems is up 46 percent compared to January of last year. The governor is also calling for $20 million to pay for more mental health outreach. I'm John Stolness. Government agency unconstitutional, says a judge in Texas. That and more when America in the Morning continues after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. Potential severe weather for the Southern Plains with the Thursday forecast. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. In the Southern Plains, another storm will be moving into the region. This system will produce widespread showers and thunderstorms for the area, some of which will be strong to severe. These storms will continue to develop through the overnight as well. There will be a risk of flash flooding, hail, damaging winds, and even tornadoes in parts of Texas into Oklahoma. Rain from this system will also spread well northward from Kansas into eastern Nebraska and southern Iowa, then to Arkansas and western Illinois. Rain will continue to build toward Wisconsin, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee tonight. Behind the storm, there will be colder air associated with this system, and snow will be developing from the central Rockies and continue into the plains from northeast Kansas into Nebraska tonight, even reaching northwest Iowa. Several inches of snow will be possible from Denver to Sioux City. Far-reaching effects from the storm will also cause a few rain and snow showers into the southwest, stretching from Southern California into Arizona and New Mexico, as well as Nevada and Utah. The northwest will have plenty of sunshine, but it'll still be on the chilly side with highs in the 30s, 40s, and low 50s. In the northeast, the latest storm to spread heavy rain will continue along coastal New England. Areas near the coast will see a total rainfall of 2 to 4 inches, with localized flooding likely to continue through the morning commute. There will also be enough cold air on the northwest side of this storm for snow to mix in through parts of New York and into Maine. The rest of the east will see improving conditions as this storm moves away with sunshine returning. Temperatures for most of the eastern cities and towns will be well above historical average by 5 to 15 degrees, with with 30s in northern New England, and then reaching into the 70s and even 80s in the southeast. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. A federal judge in Texas says the practices of a decades-old government agency are unconstitutional. Correspondent Clayton Neville explains. The minority business development agency is being sued for discrimination. White business owners behind the lawsuit. The MBDA helps gain capital for disadvantaged black-owned businesses and other racial and ethnic groups. Judge Mark Pittman ruled this week that the Nixon-era agency is violating the rights of all Americans to receive equal protection under the Constitution. He said the federal government can't flagrantly violate constitutional rights with impunity. The judge insisted, quote, the MBDA has done so for years, time's up. This comes amid continued pushback by conservatives to go after programs meant to help black Americans and other marginalized groups. A slew of recent legal actions been directed at diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives claiming they discriminate against white people. The Justice Department argues that the MBDA makes services available to any socially or economically disadvantaged business owner. I'm Clayton Neville. Concerns are growing for the U.S. and its coalition partners in the Red Sea after an Iranian-backed Houthi missile strike on a cargo ship off southern Yemen killed three crew members. The Barbados-flagged True Confidence had been abandoned and was drifting with a fire on board after the strike. The attack happened about 50 nautical miles southwest of the Yemeni city of Aden in the Gulf of Aden in international waters off the coast of Yemen. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller. The Houthis have continued to launch these reckless attacks with no regard for the well-being of innocent civilians uh, who are transiting through the Red Sea. And now um, 
they have unfortunately and tragically killed innocent civilians. The bulk carrier was sailing to Saudi Arabia from China, according to tracking data, and was carrying a cargo of steel products and trucks. On Tuesday, U.S. forces shot down a ballistic missile and three drones launched from Yemen at the destroyer USS Kearney. When we return on America in the Morning, Howell before Congress, the Fed on interest rate cuts after these messages. You're with America in the Morning. It appears the airlines are playing follow the leader when it comes to hiking their fees. In December, Alaska Airlines increased fees for a customer's first checked bag to $35. That was followed by JetBlue, which jumped their first bag fee to $45 and even more for a second bag. Last month, United and American each bumped the cost to $40 if you pay at the airport. And now Delta is joining the higher cost for your luggage club, increasing costs to $35 for your first bag, $45 for a second. Southwest Airlines still has no fee for your first two checked bags. With a look at Thursday business, here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. On Wall Street, stocks with a modest rebound yesterday after the sell-off the day before. Today, we get earnings from Costco. I'm Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after a wild day yesterday for stocks, which rebounded from Tuesday's plunge, and they finished slightly higher. Magnificent seven names were lower yesterday, though. Names like Tesla, Microsoft, Google Parent Alphabet, Amazon, and Facebook Parent Meta. Yeah, I think one by one, we're losing the uh, Magnificent Seven. I'm now seeing research notes referring to them openly as the Sensational Six. I don't know if we become the Fab Five next, and the, right? But so we've lost Apple, it's, it's lower highs. Uh, we've lost Alphabet, that's now below its long-term trend line, not looking great. Amazon's just okay. So like that theme feels really tired. Ritholtz Wealth's Josh Brown on CNBC. Investors got some hope for lower interest rates coming at some point during Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's testimony to the House Financial Services Committee. Fed Chair Jay Powell maintained the economy's in good shape, the labor market's strong, and inflation is coming down, but that the Fed needs more evidence on inflation coming down before cutting interest rates. Well, how much evidence? Maybe not as much as markets previously thought. More evidence will give us more confidence that inflation is is on a path down to 2% sustainably. We're not looking for better inflation readings than we've had. We're just looking for more of them. So in the first of two days of testimony for Congress, Powell also said the Fed can start cutting before inflation hits 2%. percent he said that before. CNBC senior economics reporter Steve Leesman. Watch New York Community Bank shares today. After yesterday's roller coaster, they plunged. Trading was then halted. Then it announced it raised a billion dollars in funding. Then trading started up. And shares popped higher. There have been worries about too many troubled office building loans on its books. The payroll forecast has fallen shy of expectations. Actually, businesses in the U.S. from tiny to major corporations didn't really grow their payrolls as much last month as forecast. They added 140,000 new workers instead of the expected 150,000. And the salary data from payroll company ADP was also interesting. Now, if you want to make significantly more money at work, changing jobs may be the way to do that. The pay increases that we're seeing, they've been coming down for job stayers, but they bumped up a little bit for job changers. That shows a labor market that's still dynamic, where you can still get a little bit of a pay bump from switching jobs. And that's the first time we've seen an increase in that number since 2022. ADP economist Neela Richardson on CNBC. Jessica Ettinger with a look at Thursday business. When we return on America in the Morning, is Congress able to keep the government operating after these messages? Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. Alabama's legislature has a new law protecting in vitro fertilization providers from legal liability prompted by a recent state court decision that deemed any frozen embryo a human being. Lisa Dwyer has details. 
Alabama Governor Kay Ivey has signed legislation that shields IVF providers from possible lawsuits and criminal prosecutions stemming from a court ruling that equated frozen embryos to children. Three major IVF providers paused services after the state Supreme Court ruled last month that three couples who had frozen embryos destroyed in an accident could pursue wrongful death lawsuits. The ruling raised concerns about civil liabilities for clinics and prompted an outcry from patients and other groups. Lawmakers pushed the immunity proposal as a way to get clinics back open, but they did not take up any legislation that would address the legal status of embryos. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Congress, one step closer to keeping the government operating. Correspondent Ed Donahue reports. A significant number of Republicans lined up against these bills. Speaker Mike Johnson says he is being realistic. We're not going to get everything that we want. We want to cut spending. We want to limit the size and scope of the federal government. The reality right now is we have divided government. We have a two-vote majority, one of the smallest in history. Massachusetts Democrat Jim McGovern says Republicans aren't serious. To get anything done, there must be bipartisanship. It has been our votes that have kept the lights on since September. We believe in governing. We believe that shutting the government down is a bad, terrible, awful idea. Lawmakers are negotiating a second package of bills, including defense, that would have all federal agencies fully funded before a March 22nd deadline. Ed Donahue, Washington. America in the Morning for Thursday, March 7th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay, senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour. Now that Nikki Haley has suspended her GOP campaign, her backers face a choice. Sagar Magani, Washington. There was more than the presidential race on the Super Tuesday ballot. I'm Clayton Neville. The chairman of the Federal Reserve told lawmakers the Fed is likely to cut its key interest rate this year. Jennifer King, Washington. Are teenagers in Philadelphia being targeted by gunmen? I'm Katie Clark with details. A jury has been seated in the trial of a father who has been charged in a Michigan school shooting. I'm Mike Hempen. Prepping for spring break in the Sunshine State. The armorer on the Alec Baldwin movie Rust has been convicted of involuntary manslaughter. I'm Archie Zaroleta with the latest. Back after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. The New England state's still dealing with rain today. Here's the Thursday forecast from AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. The latest storm to move through the northeast will continue to spread moderate to heavy rain through the coastal areas in New England. Areas near the coast will see a total rainfall of 2 to 4 inches with localized flooding. There will also be enough cold air on the northwest side of this system for snow to mix in through parts of New York, northward to northern Vermont, into Maine. The rest of the east will see improving conditions as the storm moves away with sunshine returning. Temperatures for most eastern cities and towns will be well above historical average by 5 to 15 degrees with mid-30s in northern New England, 40s, 50s, and 60s for the rest of the northeast and middle Atlantic, and warming to the 70s and even 80s in the southeast. In the Plains states, another storm will be moving through the region. This system will produce widespread showers and thunderstorms for the area, some of which will be strong to severe. These storms will continue to develop through the overnight as well. There will be a risk of flash flooding, hail, damaging winds, and even a tornado for parts of Texas into Oklahoma. Rain from this system will also spread northward from Kansas into eastern Nebraska and southern Iowa, then into Arkansas, western Illinois. And the rain will continue to build toward Wisconsin, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee tonight. Behind the storm, there will be enough cold air associated with this system, and snow will develop from the central Rockies and continue into the plains from northeast Kansas into Nebraska tonight, and then reaching even parts of northwest Iowa. Several inches of snow will be possible. That's the weather across America. Minneapolis, Minnesota will have a fairly cloudy day, a mild high of 49. It'll be a warm day in Montgomery, Alabama, with sunshine and a high of 78. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. 
According to a new Associated Press poll, at least six in 10 U.S. adults doubt President Biden's mental capability. The 81-year-old will speak to Congress and Americans tonight in his State of the Union address. On the other side of the aisle, there was a vacuum created when GOP candidate Nikki Haley suspended her campaign. Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports her voting bloc will be critical for both Donald Trump and President Biden to have in the general election. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. Now that Nikki Haley has suspended her GOP campaign, her backers face a choice. I guess if it boils down to Biden versus Trump, I have to vote for Biden. I just can't bring myself to vote for Trump for so many reasons. Um, it's the lesser of two evils, and sometimes I struggle with it, and sometimes I think maybe I shouldn't even bother voting. For weeks, Haley supporters have been bracing for this, the Biden-Trump rematch. Moving to Canada is out of the question, but I mean, it's, it's not entirely off the table. But what is plan B? From Virginia Donald Trump, 100%. to South Carolina. I would vote for Trump. I do not want another four years of Biden. To Michigan. I don't want to vote for Trump. It makes me sick to my stomach. One of Haley's backers in Maryland figures they actually now have even more power. Haley voters are going to be the story of the general election. Who wins those voters is going to matter a lot. Sagar Magani, Washington. Super Tuesday voters were tasked with selecting the presidential candidate. Their party will run in a bid for the White House. Also, there were issues on the ballot in many states. Correspondent Clayton Neville takes a look at key results across the country and their implications. In San Francisco, voters passed two public safety measures in a city that's experienced significant crime in recent years. Some say it's a result of a move away from progressive policies of a district attorney who was removed from her post back in 2022. Proposition F requires people on welfare who are suspected of being on drugs to be drug tested in order to get their benefits. Prop E also passed. It walks back some oversight and boosts police surveillance abilities in San Francisco. Meanwhile, in Texas, Democratic Congressman Colin Allred won his primary. He'll take on Republican Senator Ted Cruz in November. Our freedoms are under attack. We do have a crisis at the border that we have to respond to. Costs are still too high. We've had challenges before, and we'll have them again. But the fundamental reason that democracy works is that people elect leaders to represent them and their interests. Political experts chiming in. Matthew Wilson is a political science professor at Southern Methodist University. The fact that Colin Allred won so handily was a bit of a surprise against a crowded field. But clearly, he is the choice of the Democratic establishment. He's raised an enormous amount of money, and he will be a formidable opponent for Ted Cruz. In Texas, it was a big night for Governor Greg Abbott, who saw a lot of the candidates he endorsed have success. For him, it means better chances of getting his priorities met in the state legislature. Three of the 10 candidates Abbott endorsed are headed to runoffs, and five won their primary outright. I think what we saw with the voters was a reflection of the frustration that people are having with government. They wanted a change. Sherry Sylvester's with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. It is virtually unprecedented for nine incumbents to be defeated last night. Another eight incumbents, including the Speaker of the Texas House, to be pushed into a runoff. Like in Texas, there was a lot on the line in North Carolina on Super Tuesday, a governor's race, in fact. Josh Stein, the Democratic Attorney General, and Mark Robinson, the Republican Lieutenant Governor, are the nominees. Robinson, known as a far-right conservative, Conservative. Elsewhere among the GOP, some more moderate Republicans like Dan Crenshaw in Texas won by a narrow margin. I'm Clayton Neville. When the Federal Reserve chairman speaks, Wall Street listens. Correspondent Jennifer King reports that Jerome Powell gave his latest update on interest rates and inflation during testimony on Capitol Hill. So there have been some that say, you know, higher interest rates, um, it actually makes it more difficult to build out the renewable energy projects and other investments required to prevent climate impacts. Do you believe that to be true? It's, it's not our job to consider the effect on climate change of that. And I think any, any effect on climate change of that would be 
kind of minuscule. The chairman of the Federal Reserve told lawmakers the Fed is likely to cut its key interest rate this year, but offered no hints on when that might happen. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2 percent. Jerome Powell spoke before the House Financial Services Committee on the first of two days of semi-annual testimony to Congress. Reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of progress we've seen in inflation. Powell said there were risks associated with the timing of a rate cut. Too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. Republican Congressman Patrick McHenry is the committee chairman. From the most recent data available, food costs are up 21 percent since President Biden took office. Energy costs are up nearly 32 percent. Shelter costs are up more than 19 percent. And uh, you'll pay 37 percent more for a dozen eggs in America today. McHenry said he considers Powell to be a steady hand and urged him to resist political pressure. Instead of working to solve the underlying issues causing high prices, the administration has played the blame game, citing corporate greed and so-called shrinkflation. Jennifer King, Washington. Banning TikTok, Congress to decide. That and more when America in the Morning continues after these messages. I'm John Trout. You're with America in the Morning. There's a demand that action be taken in Philadelphia after the fourth shooting in as many days targeting teens at bus stops has parents on edge. Katie Clark reports that on Wednesday, gunmen opened fire hitting eight students waiting for a bus. A group of teenagers in Philadelphia on Wednesday were shot by gunmen while they were waiting for the city bus to arrive. The gunmen targeted the group of eight teenagers who were standing near the SEPTA bus stop. Witnesses say the gunmen were wearing masks in a car that was parked nearby. They saw the teens, drove up, and started shooting in their direction. A 16-year-old boy was shot nine times and remains in the hospital in critical condition. The gunmen shot towards a group of teens at least 30 times. The other victims are in stable condition. This is the fourth shooting at a Philadelphia SEPTA bus stop targeting teenagers in the last week. Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel. It's hard to sit here and see in three days that I have 11 juveniles shot who are going and coming from school. The cowardly acts that we've seen over the last three days are unacceptable. The downstream impact when we do not address gun violence and we do not address guns is what we see the death. Philadelphia Mayor Sherelle Parker. The people of this city know that we will not be held hostage, that we will use every legal tool in the toolbox to ensure the public health and safety of the people of our city. SEPTA is addressing the recent shootings by increasing police Police presence on and around buses and bus stops. The suspects remain at large. I'm Katie Clark. A jury has been seated in the historic shooting trial of the father of a high school shooter whose fate will be decided by a panel of nine women and six men. Correspondent Mike Hempen reports this judicial proceeding follows the guilty verdict in the case involving Ethan Crumbly's mother. The selection process took less than two days in the trial of James Crumley, whose son killed four students at Oxford High School in 2021 using a gun purchased by the father four days before the shooting. Crumley is charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each teenager killed by his son, Ethan Crumley. Opening statements and the first witness comments are scheduled for Thursday. The mother, Jennifer Crumley, was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in February, during her trial. The Crumleys are the first U.S. parents to be charged with having criminal responsibility in a mass school shooting committed by a child. I'm Mike Hempen. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is sending more law enforcement to Miami Beach and other Sunshine State spring break destinations in an effort to keep things under control. DeSantis made the announcement at a news conference saying they'll provide about 60 Florida state troopers and an additional 24 that are part of a quick response team for South Florida, while other police resources will be stationed around Daytona Beach and Panama City. A chaotic 2023 spring break in Miami Beach Beach saw two deadly shootings and 488 arrests, nearly half of those felonies. The United Nations says a record number of migrants, including those headed to Europe and the U.S., died last year trying to find a better place to live. Correspondent Rita Foley reports. 
In all, 8,565 migrants died on land and sea routes worldwide last year. That's according to the U.N. Migration Agency, a record high since it began keeping track a decade ago. Thousands of the deaths were from drowning. It says the biggest increase in deaths last year was on the dangerous Mediterranean Sea crossing, where for years, huge numbers of Syrians, Afghans and others have run toward Europe, trying to get away from conflicts. Overall, the biggest jump in deaths in recent years has been in Asia, where, for instance, Afghans have been fleeing to places like neighboring Iran. A record number of deaths also occurred in Africa last year, mostly in the Sahara Desert and along the sea route to the Canary Islands. A U.N. official says every one of these deaths is a terrible human tragedy that reverberates, he says, through families and communities for years to come. I'm Rita Foley. Congress is set to vote today on measures to ban TikTok if the Chinese parent company ByteDance does not sell it. Here's Chuck Palm with that in today's tech news. A bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers introduced legislation on Tuesday to give China's ByteDance about six months to divest popular short video app TikTok or face a U.S. ban. Legislation stalled in the U.S. Congress last year due to heavy lobbying and its popularity. More than a dozen lawmakers from both sides of the House have introduced the measure, which is expected to see a vote today. Senator Mike Gallagher said, This is my message to TikTok. Break up with the Chinese Communist Party or lose access to your American users. In a somewhat related story, a former Google software engineer has been indicted in California on charges of stealing trade secrets related to artificial intelligence from Google's Alphabet unit in order to benefit Chinese companies. According to the indictment, the stolen information relates to the hardware infrastructure and software that lets Google supercomputing data centers train large AI models through machine learning. Leave a comment at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. With a look at Thursday morning sports on America in the morning, here's Robert Workman. The U.S. women edged Canada on penalties late last night in San Diego to advance to the inaugural CONCACAF Women's Gold Cup Final. They'll face Brazil for the title on Sunday. Hockey Austin Matthews' 54th goal of the season came in overtime as the Maple Leafs shaded the Sabres 2-1, Ducks down the Senators 2-1, and the Avalanche buried the Red Wings 7-2 defenseman Kale McCarr with his first career hat trick. Colorado also traded for Flyers defenseman Sean Walker and Sabres center Casey Middlestadt. The NHL trade deadline comes up tomorrow. NBA, the Warriors wallop the Bucks 125 to 90. That ends Milwaukee's six game winning streak. De'Aaron Fox had 44 to lead the Kings over the Lakers. Thunder doused the Blazers 37 for Shea Gilgis Alexander. Magic whacked the Wizards, Washington's 16th consecutive loss, tying the franchise record. But interim coach Brian Keefe says better days are coming. This group is getting closer. We're playing better. We just got to put it together for 48 minutes. And these guys are learning from game to game. Elsewhere, the Clippers came from behind to beat the Rockets. Grizzlies rally past the Sixers, Hawks surprised the Cavaliers, and the Bulls held off the Jazz. College basketball, number one Houston, trailed at halftime, but came back to win at Central Florida. LJ Cryer with 19 of his game-high 25 points after intermission. The Cougars clinch at least a share of the Big 12 title in their first year in the conference. Number two Connecticut won at number eight Marquette. It's the Huskies' first road win over a top 25 team in 10 years. And fourth-ranked Tennessee clinched the SEC crown with a win at number 17 South Carolina. That's Thursday Sports. Thank you, sir. When we return on America in the Morning, Armorer from the movie set of Rust learns her fate after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. The closing statements made by the prosecution and defense in the involuntary manslaughter trial for the armorer on the Alec Baldwin movie Rust may have taken longer than the jury leaving the courtroom and rendering a verdict. Entertainment correspondent Margie Zaraleta reports a decision was reached in just two hours. Weapon supervisor Hannah Gutierrez-Reed blew a kiss to a relative as she was led away after her conviction. A jury in Santa Fe, New Mexico, found her guilty in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins in October 2021. Will the defendant please stand? We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. 
We find the defendant, Anna Gutierrez, not guilty of tampering with evidence. This charge should come to Alec Baldwin was pointing a gun at Hutchins during a rehearsal when the gun went off. Prosecutors said Gutierrez-Reed unwittingly brought live ammunition onto the set and failed to maintain industry standards on gun safety. No one called her out of the church. There wasn't a COVID protocol in place that prevented her from being in the church at that moment. You know from the production outfitter videos she didn't care about her job. She let it all go. She faces up to 18 months in prison and a $5,000 fine at a sentencing date yet to be named. Baldwin will be tried for involuntary manslaughter in July. I'm Archie Zaroleta. In another courtroom, the trial in the Hotel California case has an unexpected conclusion. Kevin Carr has that. The Eagles' 1976 song, Hotel California, has one of the greatest endings in rock history. But the trial over the ownership of its original handwritten lyrics had an unexpected end. On Wednesday, in a New York courtroom rather than a dark desert highway, prosecutors dropped their case against Glenn Horowitz, Craig and Chardy, and Edward Kaczynski, three memorabilia experts accused of multiple crimes, including conspiracy to possess stolen property. Defense lawyers said they were overwhelmed with thousands of pages of communication between Eagles member Don Henley and his lawyers. Henley decided to waive attorney-client privilege only a few days ago, offering a trove of new information. While the contents were not made public, the defense attorney said that if they had access to them during discovery, they would have called more witnesses and asked additional questions. Henley had already taken the stand last week. After the court adjourned, Scott Edelman, attorney for Edward Kaczynski, spoke to the AP. The district attorney in this case got blinded by the fame and the fortune of a celebrity and brought a case that would never be brought. Jonathan Bach, attorney for Glenn Horowitz, also spoke. The evidence, the newly produced evidence, corroborated fundamental defense points about why they were not guilty. Henley still maintains the lyrics were stolen and plans to move the case to civil court to ensure their return. I'm Kevin Carr. America in the Morning for Thursday, March 7th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay, senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One.